This is Bartolome Tomic with Offshore Engineer TV. With us is uh, Case van Veluw with Hausman from the Netherlands. Thank you for accepting this interview. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and tell us about your role in Hausman and in particular in relation to offshore crane development? Sure. I'm product director of cranes at Hausman, uh, working at Hausman since 2005 and started as a structural engineer in the mechanical engineering department working on large offshore cranes. My role is uh, to support our sales team with uh, providing them proposals, new technical developments, etc. When I took the assignment to produce an article focusing on uh, heavy, lift, heavy lifting cranes and deck machinery for our uh, offshore engineer magazine, I immediately thought of Hausman uh, as a company best suited for coverage in this space, uh, especially from the LEC perspective where there seems to be high demand uh, for Hausman LECs like encircling cranes, uh, judging by the number of orders from the offshore wind space. So uh, we want to discuss this in a bit more detail and that's why we're here. So could you explain to our readers what an LEC is and what are some of its unique benefits for offshore wind installation firms? All right. Well, uh, an LEC is indeed a lack and circling crane and uh, it's installed in a jacket vessel. And like the name says, uh, well, the jacket vessels, they have legs and the crane circles them, uh, circles around them. Uh, a jacket vessel is um, lifted out of the water uh, legs are put on the seabed, um, the jacking system pushes up the, the vessel. And um, this way the vessel has turned into a stable platform for installing wind turbines. Um, when you put a crane on, there's always a battle for space on the vessel. So um, if you have the crane somewhere between the legs on the side or between the, the two aft legs, so you have it on the stern, um, there are always uh, one or more legs um, taking up all the all the space. So if you circle the crane around the leg, so you have the leg in the center line of the crane, then actually one leg is out of the equation for all your operational procedures. So this this is the reason why I produced quite a few of them. Um, basically, the whole idea started with, uh, hey, uh, can we put a, a ringer crane like the PTC-35 we supplied to Mammoth? Can we uh, put a crane like that on a Jacob vessel? Well, it started that way and then we uh, moved on and on and on with that one. And it has been fine-tuned with many models and this is where we are right now. It has been quite a, quite a popular model for installation of turbines mainly, but also for installation of foundations. Uh, so can you share some insights into both the technical capabilities of the LECs you're currently building, as well as any customizations required by the clients? So can you share some, uh, if possible, named cases and explain what the offshore wind vessel owners are looking for? Yeah, sure. Um, well, all of the lack and circling cranes, they, uh, they're full electric. So uh, it's hard to name it. They're all full electric. And this provides operational accuracy and reliability. Um, it's also reducing the energy consumption and it's reducing the noise production and they're more reliable. I mean, uh, there is no uh, hose bursts in, uh, in a full electric crane anymore. Customization is basically done by almost all of our customers and that depends on who configurations, boom lengths, uh, features, speeds. They're all evaluated by our clients and we have tailored many of those cranes. It's also uh, paint systems, extra systems, the, uh, the operator cabin layouts, where there are different opinions about many of our customers who are typically not new to the shipping market, but they, they have vessels, they have opinions, they have crane operators, they have experience. So uh, that's all bringing their specific demands. So um, it's not really enough to shelf product. We have our bases, we have our philosophies, our drive systems, etc. But with that one, we're able to customize to whatever turbine installation vessel owner would need. Um, what they generally need is, or looking for these days is uh, bigger and bigger, not only in safe working load, but also bigger in uh, hook height. Uh, and that's typically represented by the length of the boom of the crane. So, um, a 140 meter boom used to be a very long boom in 2020, but these days people are contracting us for booms of 155 meter boom length, and they're looking at more. 
Yeah, that was my, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but this, this was exactly my next question. Is there a limit to how big these cranes can get, given that offshore wind turbines seems to be getting, seem to be getting bigger and bigger? So what are the engineering challenges to making them as big as, as uh, needed for these big turbines? Well, uh, we are indeed looking at the uh, at even bigger versions. So we are also having a, a model which is a five thousand tons like encirclement crane. We have that model ready. Um, it, it has to be seen in conjunction with the total vessel. So uh, one of the th the tricky things with the vessel is the jacking system. Um, we've also started looking into jacking systems ourselves. Uh, we have a full scale demonstrator in our facility in Skidam, which is open for um, evaluation by our clients as well. And uh, we have seen that uh, bigger cranes need bigger jacking systems. And uh, when there is, let's say, a big engineering challenge or seeing that there is a limitation ahead there, then we're looking at how we can move, push that limit onward. On the crane, uh, well, probably there is somewhere a limit, but the limit is not at the 5,000 ton and, uh, and the boom lengths of, let's say, 170, 175 meters we're facing today. Um, it can be bigger uh, on the crane perspective. It can be longer. Is there going to be a, a need uh, soon for, for that bigger crane? Because if well, I understand yeah, the, correctly, the, the ones that you're currently building are already being built for the future. So, Yeah, um, they are built for the future, but uh, the, the growth pace of turbines is still, uh, still quite big. It's not, it's not that long ago that the 10 megawatt turbine was called futuristic, and now it's a small one. Uh, the first 15 megawatt turbine uh, has yet to be installed in a full-scale wind farm. And still, if you talk about 15 megawatts, it's, let's say, people talk about it like it's very common, uh, uh, a common turbine, and it's not ambitious anymore. So there are indeed, I mean, uh, right now, um, some environmental applications, then you have to state what kind of turbine you are, you plan to use. So there's a variation, a variant to go to for 15 megawatt ones, but there's also people who put in um, 27 megawatts with even bigger rotor diameters, et cetera. So when that is, let's say, it is not completely developed yet, but uh, if people expect that one to be developed, the crane should also be available for that one. If there is a there is a turbine, but there is no crane to install that turbine, then it's hard to get that turbine up and running. Yeah. Um, um, the mark. Well, you meant you, you, one of your questions was also uh, the purpose of this five thousand ton. And well, basically, the purpose is twofold. One is bringing the turbine up, and the other one is bringing the foundation in the water. And uh, there is a kind of two big uh, mainstream methods and one is uh, to come with a floating vessel, a monohull vessel with a crane uh, like uh, Les Alizés uh, and have a motion composite power gripper like we delivered to the Orion and the Boca Lift 2. So that is one method. Um, you avoid jacking with that one, but you get some vessel motion in return. And the other way is to go for a big jack-up vessel um, installing foundations. So Van Oort is doing that a lot uh, with Aeolus. They're not planning to do similar things with Boreas as well, but uh, also Kettler has moved to their F class um, with the F of foundation. The hybrid they one, have... right? Yeah. Uh, and um, well, basically this, uh, this vessel has also been optimized for foundations. The crane safe working load has been upgraded to beyond 3000 ton for that to install uh, monopiles from the Jacob vessel. As we mentioned, uh, you received uh, a slew of orders uh, to supply cranes for new build WTIVs, but there have, have also been orders to update older vessels with more capable cranes. Can you talk about um, any significant differences in, in approach? So when you have to upgrade the, the old vessel versus installing a crane on a new vessel? Yeah. Well, we are in the in the industry of renewables, and renewables is focused on being green. So, um, a very short period, uh, well, a very short lifetime of a vessel that's not really sustainable. Um, and I mean, uh, all the carbon and uh, the money is already spent on uh, building that vessel. So, keeping it a bit longer relevant, that's a very good thing. And upgrading uh, the vessel by installing a new crane, that's um, 
uh, that's probably quite a good one. Uh, we started that actually with um, uh, the MPI resolution where we uh, extended the vessel's lifetime by adding a 600 ton crane on, and then it was installing uh, another uh, batch of turbines. But I mean, um, they're not very active in that, on that one anymore with that vessel. Um, Do you have any, any range of how long the, the lifetime or useful? Uh, useful yeah, well, one example is, uh, uh, well, well, a good example is probably um, uh, what uh, both Fred Olson and Demi recently did. Uh, Fred Olson, they replaced the crane on Boltern. Uh, Demi replaced it on C installer. So the, they took off their old 800 or 900 tons crane and put on a 1600 tons crane from Huisman. Um both with a 140 meter boom. So not only the capacity was increased, but also the lifting height was drastically increased. Um, it's possible given the low weight of our cranes that we supply. And this way, uh, a vessel of around 10 year old was uh, able to extend the lifetime for another few years with the next generation of turbines. So uh, there are some challenges with that one. If you work on a vessel which is uh, only existing in the basic design and is yet to be built, then it's easier to make a few adaptions to make the whole integration more easy. Here, the vessel is there and the, you need to make more adaptions to the crane to make it fit. I would say on power connections, pedestal integration to get, let's say, all the loads nicely transferred into the vessel's hull. So um, uh, there are some challenges with that one, but I mean, we have our own engineering department uh, suitable for challenging these uh, these kind of matters. So yeah, okay. it's it's our day-to-day -day job. How long does it take to build one such? LEC and what is the biggest challenge from the moment an offshore crane gets ordered to the moment it gets installed on a vessel? Delivery times of a, of a crane, of an LEC crane, is typically between two and two and a half years. It depends a little bit on the features, the moment in time, and the level of customization, but it's safe to think about that. I would say big, there are basically two, two big challenges. One is the supply chain especially during COVID and during uh, the start of the war in Ukraine, there was a big disruption in supply chain, which has caused some issues on our end as well, like with everyone. It's stabilizing now, thankfully. The other, the other aspect is uh, the installation. It's a big crane that needs to come on a big vessel. Um, so the exact uh, integration has to be discussed with the owner, uh, if there's a yard involved also with the yard. Um, so uh, we saw that one coming. We invested in a big skyhook crane in our facility in China, and um, uh, that has been used for quite a few big crane installations. And there is probably a few more to come soon, we hope. So you are saying that you are actually installing it in your yard uh, rather than, well, where possible, rather than shipping it to a shipyard and then having them install it. You need to think about the whole schedule on that one. Um, the crane is not the only aspect of a vessel. Uh, there's way more. Um, and uh, for some vessels, uh, it's best to do uh, the installation on a shipyard of the crane on a shipyard uh, and put then a lag later on if it's a, a jackup vessel. For some other ones, it's, uh, I mean, if, for example, if it's a conversion, then the whole schedule could look differently. So um, we're adding another solution to the mix. So for example, we have been uh, involved with in the installation of the crane for uh, Fred Olsen's ball turn, which was a conversion. It was done in, um, in Singapore at the Keppel Yard. And that was a tandem lift with uh, the Asian Hercules two and three with uh, two shear legs, which was quite a spectacular one. Um, and that had to do with also the logistics but for some other instances, uh, it's easier to have the vessel coming along our key site uh, in our own facility in Asia. So that's what's, for example, been done with Boca Lift 2. Well, it's also the thing is that most of those vessels are built in Asia these days. So you know, the place of your uh, skyhook is it, it's a good place to be with your crane there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there, there's indeed uh, the majority of the vessels is built over there. But uh, yeah, but you're also so, some are built the in the Middle East, sect, some, right? 
Yeah, correct. Uh, we supplied the crane to the first Jones Act vessel, to the, the Charybdis, um, uh, which is a Dominion's vessel. So it's um, uh, we're happy to be um, in every part of the world. Yeah, and this one uh, in in the, for the Charybdis, this was uh, in. Well, was it integrated or is it yet, yet to be integrated into the? It has yet to be integrated. It has oh, been okay. delivered to the shipyard um, in the U.S. In Texas, right? Uh, Correct, Brownsville, Texas, Capo yeah. Enfels. Um, uh, there's something else I want to ask. So you've been with the uh, Houseman since 2005. Uh, what is the project you're most proud of in the offshore crane and deck machinery space? Well, can you reply to this one and I'll do a follow up after this sure. one. Uh, I'm with Heisman since 2005 indeed and worked on a lot of a lot of projects so it's hard to select one that I like the most and uh, typically you remember the things that are not that far away in the history uh, and um, basically one of the things that popped up my mind uh, immediately was the 5,000 tons active heave compensated top mounted crane we delivered to uh, Jan de Nul recently. So um, I had the opportunity to visit the vessel last weekend and uh, also show it to my kids. Uh, there are, I mean, kids of three and five, they really like uh, it already. But I mean, uh, the beauty of that crane is that it comes with uh, active heave compensation, both for the auxiliary hoist and the uh, main hoist. Uh, it can be used for foundation installation and many other jobs. And um, I think this is one of the most, uh, uh, advanced cranes that we ever delivered. So um, yeah, it makes me proud. Yeah, can you go into more specifics uh, about what is what is it that makes it special? Is it just the sheer capacity of? No, it's not it just the sheer from? capacity. Uh, we have delivered bigger cranes like the 10,000 tons cranes, uh, the two of them delivered to the Sleipner vessels of uh, Herema. But um, uh, this one's comes with active heave compensation, uh, comes with a lot of automation features that we have been developing in uh, the recent years, and it has been executed here. So for a lot of those new features, we have a few one-offs included. Um, it's also including the quick connector system. So that allows to uh, hands-off change big tools in a very quick way. So you don't need to send people to the hook anymore. Um, there's a lot of repetitive movements in uh, offshore wind installation business, both in the turbine installation as well as in the foundation installation. So getting some good automation is an improvement in safety and an improvement in efficiency. So that we could get all those aspects up and running on that crane vessel. It's um, a very good achievement and I'm happy that we could do it with a very great team. Uh, we've done it with a lot of people inside our organization. So, um, yeah. And if you could just name the vessel, is it Les Alizé or is it Voltaire? Yeah, it's Les Alizé. Okay. Yeah, Les Alizé, yeah. All right. Um, could you discuss the evolution of the order book when it comes to offshore cranes? What percentage today comes from the offshore wind space and what from offshore oil and gas? given that it's Ooh, been a while uh, since somebody ordered a, uh, a drilling rig in the offshore space. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, even though there was a downturn, there was some revenue, uh, also new build aspects in the oil and gas industry as well. So it has not been nothing, uh, but indeed it has been uh, slowing down in the last, uh, last few years. Uh, things are picking up again, though. Um, the oil price is uh, today pretty stable around the, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, dollars per barrel. Um, with all the geopolitical tensions, we see that offshore oil and gas is not that bad anymore in people's perception. Um, it's quite a stable one if you look at the, if you are in the US um, with all the uh, the fields in the Permian, etc. They are um, you can deliver fast when you drill uh, first drilling to first oil. Yeah, but, but the uh, is offshore, are... right? Yeah, that's onshore, but it's also yeah. depleting quickly. So uh, with that aspect, all the, the 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 offshore fields that we're used to, they um, it takes a bit longer to develop, but they also last longer. So that's um, actually quite a sustainable way of um, getting the oil and gas. And um, well, I think oil and gas is to stay there for a while. Um, uh, there's a big 
push for renewable energy, but um, the energy transition is not done overnight. And um, in her order book, yeah, I mean, um, I would say back in 2013, 14, uh, we were supplying to the offshore wind industry, but this was a minor market for us and the oil and gas was the major market. Now things have shifted. Uh, the majority of our revenue is coming from the offshore wind and um, oil and gas is not the biggest anymore for us, but it's still important. I mean, uh, we have long lasting relationships uh, in the oil and gas, uh, also in the shipping industry. I mean, the heavy lift transport shipping is supplying to both oil and gas and offshore wind. So we're mixed, we call it energy industry um, and things can be with oil and gas, things can be with offshore wind and uh, um, technology we've developed for offshore for uh, the offshore oil and gas proved to be pretty useful in the on offshore wind and also the other way around uh, some new techniques that we have been developing for the offshore wind are now also proving to be quite valuable in the oil and gas so it's um, it's good to be in both and um, it's also good to um, um, be able to bring uh, more sustainability to the oil and gas business, for example, reducing fuel consumption by more efficient drilling, etc. Oh, so you're speaking about the technologies other than the cranes that you're supplying to? Yeah, I mean, we supply uh, also uh, full automated drilling rigs um, uh, with a high level of automation, which is also uh, providing much more efficiency. So you can come with a way smaller drilling rig. Um, uh there is still uh, oil and gas around um but there is still a long way to go to make it more sustainable so uh we want to be there as well rystad energy said last year that from 2024 the offshore wind could face bottlenecks as there wouldn't be enough capable vessels to install the planned wind farms which are designed to feature 10 megawatt plus turbine. Can you talk about trends you see in this space? How many cranes cranes have you delivered? Are you working working on that can install 10 megawatt plus turbines? Well, um, uh, this 10 megawatt uh, is now something that I mean everyone is that's ordering a crane right now. The 10 megawatt one is easy. Um, I mean, uh, you you listed quite a few orders from. Uh, from uh, Fred Olsen, Dimi, Von Oort, Kettler, Hafram, uh, Entity, Dominion, etc. And all of them, they are capable for uh, which, uh, 15 megawatts and be, uh, at least, and uh, some of them more than that. So people have learned from, uh, from the past that you shouldn't order a crane too small. Turbines keep on growing and growing, and there will be another moment in time that some cranes are too small. It, it will happen. Uh, yeah. Do, do you maybe know what the current record is uh, for a uh, houseman LEC when it comes to offshore wind turbine installation? So you pick weight, height, megawatt wise. I don't have a don't have a detailed figure on the exact record. Uh, I should be benchmarking our clients there, which I yeah ah, okay. normally don't do. All right. Um, well, I had to try so because, because people like to to hear about records in in, in the offshore space. Uh, yeah. Well, so I can I can make a make a comment on that one. We just delivered the biggest uh, like a circling crane in the world to Yonder Null, which is Yonder Null's Voltaire vessel. And uh, uh, I just checked on marine traffic. It was uh, loading wind turbine components uh, on the east coast of the UK. So it's uh, it's uh, about to install another batch of turbines um, in the UK sector of the North Sea. Um, this crane is the biggest one, the biggest like and circling crane that we have delivered so far. Um, there is even bigger ones to come, but um, uh, that's a record. Uh, it's a very big vessel. Uh, it's wide, it has long legs and a very big crane on. So that's yeah, a record. And I'll on have own. to look it up uh, to see which project is it installing the turbines for because I couldn't, can't remember right uh, on the bat. So, uh, but you've received orders for LECs that can install 20 megawatt plus turbines. So this is one of those, right? That, that you mentioned. Yeah, correct, correct. Well, uh, yeah, we received it. And in the meanwhile, we have delivered it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's also from one from Van Oort. Correct. That's going to be able. Is it bigger or is it the same or is it even smaller? I'm... It's uh, the frame size of the crane is the same, uh, but the, the capacities has been squeezed a bit more. The boom length is a bit more, etc. Ah. So it's uh, it's so, bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to ask, so can you help us understand the sheer size and ability of these largest LECs uh, and feel free to convert their lifting capability into, for example, a number of jumbo jets that they can lift, because this is also something that I've seen people do uh, for, for bragging rights, if anything else. Yeah, well, with the jumbo jet, it makes a, it makes a lot of difference whether you have fueled it or not. And, uh, yeah. the, and people in it uh, or not. Yeah, correct. But anyway, the um, uh, Jan de Nul has been marketing a Sputcan to boom tip uh, 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 equivalent to the Eiffel Tower, and with the longer booms, even that limit is uh, is beaten. So uh, it's mind blowing how how big a, how big it is. Yeah, even with the new antenna on the Eiffel Tower, or because I haven't been checking the antenna. I'm not. Oh, okay. uh, I, I'm not a da daily visitor to the Eiffel Tower. To All be right, honest. me neither. Um, so, can we talk about the future a bit? So, what does the future hold for Houseman in the offshore wind space? Uh, we've seen that you're proud of all your uh, your all electric cranes, but what's next? Is it AI? Uh, is it work from home? Uh, that seems interesting for the next generation employees. Uh, is there a future where an offshore crane operator will be installing a 20 megawatt turbine from the comfort of his home or, or her home? Yeah, well, uh, I think focus will be uh, most in efficiency and safety and uh, remote control can be an, uh, a consequence of that one rather than a goal. I think uh, uh, the goal of doing the actual lift from the comfort of uh, anyone's home, if he is more comfortable with that, uh, is of less importance than focus on efficiency and safety. Um, but remote control can bring something there. Um, we have improved our remote serviceability of the cranes recently, so the need to bring people in uh, for service and for evaluations has been, has been, has been, uh, has been less and less. So um, that saves on uh, trips, that saves on downtime, etc. So, um, and that's adding to the efficiency. I mean, the higher the uptime of all the equipment and the more the people on board can do with help from, uh, from onshore, uh, the more efficiency is gained and uh, well, ultimately the lower the cost of energy will be. Um, another trend is to make use of automated tools. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, we have supplied a few cranes with a quick connector integrated in the crane. And integrating a piece of equipment like that is uh, making the whole chain of operations much more efficient. And that's much more efficient than um, uh, combining a lot of aftermarket solutions. So uh, integrating the crane um, with an unpending pile gripper also uh, like a, uh, we do on the Orion, uh, a pile handling system like a, a automated spreader bars that have interaction with the crane and a flange lifting tool uh, using the quick connector, quickly changing tools um, without uh, killing the lifting height, without uh, having safety concerns. I think that's the future. And um, uh, there's quite some automation to that one. Um, other safety aspects uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, they make can make use of AI, but I think uh, things like you mentioned, uh, AI, it's not a goal in itself, but it could be a solution of improving safety and reliability and efficiency. Thank you very much, Case. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're welcome.